Well, the Fort Worth desegregation plan has been very successful, one of the most successful in the country. We uh, are. If, if you can't bus some of the students, how successful will it be? Will it ruin it? Our reaction is that, and we heard this from HEW, that our cluster plan is probably one of the most successful in the country. In fact, I've just come back from San Francisco to a school board convention where we were complimented at an open meeting of, of how we have integrated without confrontation. And it seems to be a model that we have, the people of Fort Worth, uh, black and white, have cooperated beautifully. But if the, the busing were curtailed in the future, would the cluster plan uh, still be successful? No, I don't think so. I think we'd have to have the busing that we have now to make the cluster plan work. And the cluster plan, uh, we have not had one incident of, of, or problem in the cluster plan. We're, we're pleased to announce that we've made a grant reservation of $2,235,000 to finance the acquisition of this uh, 2,113 acres of uh, Greenbelt property along the Trinity River bottom. This land runs from uh, North Lake down to White Rock Creek, and the eventual development of this will be golf courses, horseback riding, bicycle trails, camping, uh, golfing, and uh, uppermost in our mind was the preservation of the existing green space and the ecology and the environment that exists there today. Now, this, this, our grant will be matched with $1,118,000 of city bond money, and it's also been made possible through the generous donation of 652 acres of land by Mr. John Stemmons. His contribution card, uh, counts as part of the, uh, the city's share of uh, our grant. Tarrant County Commissioner Skeet Richardson says he thinks the county must have a computer for law enforcement and other work, even if it has to be purchased with county money and no outside help. I asked him why the county hit a snag in getting its initial plan approved. Well, I think really that uh, the fellow that is managing the computer, the LEA funds in Texas, uh, Mr. Click uh, from Austin, has already expended most of the funds that are available. Uh, he did this on a priority basis that was set up by COG and, and out of the Arlington office. I think that where they misjudged was that they didn't consider Tarrant County as being a priority county at that time. Therefore, they spent this money in areas like uh, uh, El Paso and in cities that had uh, uh, populations of just a little over 100,000. And uh, he got himself in a little hot water. And then he came back and had to try to explain why he was letting a county with 800,000 be passed by. The city of Fort Worth was never an overly eager participant in the plan to get the computer, saying in statements from high offices that anything that helps the officer in the field deserves consideration and saying little more. Privately, though, they say that Tarrant County asked too much of the Council of Governments, didn't do its own homework properly, and should never have expected such a plan to gain federal approval. One high-ranking city official, restating the potential value of such a plan, if properly executed, described his view of the way it had been handled by the county by saying, quote, I'm washing my hands of the entire affair. Jerry Taff, Channel 8 News on the Move, at City Hall in Fort Worth. Last year, we could point to these tracks and say it had been a long time since a passenger train had been over them, but at that time, it looked as though in a few months, diesel engines would once again be hauling diners and pullmans and coaches into Dallas. That was last year, and still these tracks at Union Depot are rusty with disuse. 
Since then, despite pleading from Dallas officials and the formation of a special city-county committee to get Amtrak into Dallas, Washington has done little, and even nationwide, Amtrak doesn't look as though it's in much better shape. Congressional committees hearing the request for more funds for Amtrak have insisted that executive salaries be cut, that the corporation spend more money on passenger equipment, and that they get the trains running on time. Coinciding with the hearings, Amtrak has decided on a schedule reshuffle, including the addition of trains on the New York to Washington run, one of the few places in the nation where money is made, and another train on the route of the old Santa Fe Super Chief from Chicago to Los Angeles. The new train will be called the Chief. But what about Dallas? Well, Amtrak officials dragged their feet on getting passenger service into Dallas for a long time, using as an excuse their theory that Dallasites weren't interested in passenger service. But reportedly now, the regional director in Houston has said he's impressed with the work of the city county committee and that he feels Dallasites may be interested in getting passenger service after all. Well, Amtrak has said that before, and there still aren't any trains here in Dallas Union Depot. This is Phil Reynolds, Channel 8 News on the Move. Speaking here before the American Society of Civil Engineers, William Allison, who is the Deputy Administrator of the United States Urban Mass Transportation Department, explain what the federal government is doing to help the problems of mass transportation across the United States. Since April 1970, we have made grants totaling over a billion dollars to the cities of Dallas, Fort Worth, and to the North Central Texas Regional Council of Government to help in developing comprehensive transportation plans for the, this particular region. Allison says that mass transportation in this country is a very sick patient and virtually dying. And he says there is no one ingredient for the cure of the disease. He did say that two of the cures is the federal monies for capital assistance and a strong federally sponsored research and development program. The third ingredient to cure the mass transportation problem, Allison says, is a local commitment to support public transportation, to write it and to pay for it and to subsidize its operations when it is necessary. He says that we are seeing this commitment today in many of our urban areas, especially in the Fort Worth and Dallas area. Jim Green, Channel 8 News on the Move in Fort Worth. Hank Grover leans heavily on his conservatism in his campaign for the Texas governor's seat. He claims to be independent, saying lobbyists in Austin don't like him because he's not in their pockets. And he charged today that the state Republican hierarchy, in his words, ran other candidates into this year's primary election to split the GOP vote statewide. Grover, a college teacher from Houston, points out that he's the only Republican gubernatorial candidate with legislative experience. He has 12 years in the House and Senate. But his major campaign points deal with education and welfare, both of which he attacked heavily in his press club speech today. One thing we have to do, and I've been fighting this battle, is to get control of the education establishment. The Gilmer-Aiken bill was enacted in 1949. It's been amended many, many times since. There's not a member of the legislature who can look at the laws cited in the appropriations bill and tell you what they do. Now, we need to go in and redirect and reorder that money and do what this federal court is now going to force us to do. We've done it a long time ago, and that is go to a much simpler formula and allocate the money on a per capita basis to the individual school districts. That's the first step. I think secondly is in the welfare department. The welfare department is headed by a professional bureaucratic hack by the name of Raymond Vowell. And Mr. Vowell was in the state mental health department when I first got elected to the legislature and left there under something of a cloud and then was taken in under the wing of Frank Irwin over at the University of Texas. And then Preston Smith got him in as welfare commissioner. His answer to everything is just give us more money. That's not the answer. We must reorganize that department and see that the money goes to the aged and the truly needy and eliminate what I consider the flagrant abuses and the attitude of the people in the welfare department. Jerry, I tell you, it was 
Hey, I think it was it was a good round. I started out a little shaky, really, because I had to hit. I played the tenth hole today uh, for the first one. I had to hit a five iron in there, and then I, I didn't hit. Uh, I didn't hit it well for the next three, four holes. But then I got back together, and then uh, on the third hole was my downfall. I should have made four there. I lost two shots, really. I made six. But this has been my problem all year, Jerry. I've been making sixes on the par fives, and I'm not thinking well on the par fives. And my caddy, Rock, told me, he says, we shouldn't hit that wood. Just lay up with an iron, and then we'll make five and get away from the hole. We're in trouble. And I, I, I thought I could hook that five wood around there. And I was lucky I didn't go out of bounds, really. For the sake of your many fans who'll want to come out and follow you tomorrow, what's your tee off time? And you go off one or 18? I go off number one at 9.04, and I hope to come out and we can shoot another 66 and take this thing out this year. Uh, it was a pleasure shooting that round today because uh, I've been playing good and I have had not been scoring too well, but today everything got together and uh, thanks God that I that I play so well. Was the condition of the course noticeably changed because of the weather? Well, Vern, I think it played easier. Uh, it plays easier like this uh, because you can fire the ball at the at the greens. See, the greens are holding now, which I think is the way that golf ought to be played. I think that any man that hits a good iron, uh, the ball ought to back up. You know, that's, that puts a lot of skill into golf. You know, these greens were really fast out here Wednesday for the Pro-Am, weren't they? Oh, yeah. They, they were not as fast today, but they will get uh, fast again before Sunday's over. <laughs> <laughs> Have you changed the style of play at all? Have you altered your, you know, you were always the, the clown prince of golf uh, before Lee kind of uh, assumed the role. Have you changed it all? Well, uh, Vern, I I, uh, I always played uh, for the fans, you know, which is which is good. Uh, of course, the fans left me. You know, I, I, uh, I finished out of the top 60 money winners, and they all left me. But uh, uh, I'm not bitter because if I would have been following myself, I would have left me too. You know, I was playing so bad. So I decided that I was going to play golf more uh, with more concentration. You sounded like a man who was very pleased with his putting today, Bob. Yeah, finally. I didn't uh, make uh, any long putts, uh, surprisingly enough, but I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot of long putts to, to make. I hit the ball well today, and uh, I made those good uh, five, you know, uh, like five to eight foot putts. I made a couple of those, and boy, when you do that, then it's a new game. And no three putt greens, I understand. No three putts, right. <laughs> did you, uh, have you done anything to alter your stance at all, putting? Yeah, I did. I changed it all together. I went back to my old way of putting. Uh, I had changed a little bit to be more basic in putting, but I found out I don't have quite the touch that I used to have, so I went back and tried my old way last week while I was taking a week off, and uh, by George, it works. Well, I hit the ball pretty well, hit my irons up close, and I missed a couple of putts I could have made, but I can't argue with it. I, I just, I've never seen the course till today, because I got in here Wednesday, got in late, and uh, hit my irons, just knocked them close all day, and I was just fortunate enough to make a couple of putts. What uh, what was the reason for your not coming in uh, early enough to practice? Well, after Tallahassee, I had to go home because I'm getting married in two weeks, <laughs> and I had to take the blood test and get the license and everything, so uh, I had to rush on out here late. Be kind of a nice wedding gift, wouldn't it, yeah, to sure finish would. high in the money? Sure would. Be great. with 69 I just disappointed in the way I played uh, 69 is a good score in this golf any golf course mm -hmm. anytime you break 70 here you're you know you've got to play pretty well but I was I had to scramble a bit and I was in, in three bunkers and got it up and down and I missed a few other greens and I was over in the trees a few times and uh, I'm just I'm, I'm just happy to have 69 and go on to the second round because I think I can go out and practice a little bit this afternoon and I'll hit the ball better tomorrow I don't know whether I'll score better but I I think I'll hit the ball better. We saw you in the trees over on nine. Uh, you made a great shot to come out of it and get on the green. Well, that was just one of the holes I was in the trees. <laughs> but I did get out of the trees there and uh, got it up on the edge of the green and two-putted it for a par. So, yeah, but those, those are the kind of things that can make the difference between 75 and 69. I mean, is the, is the Lee Trevino we know the Lee Trevino you know? I think so, yeah. I think uh, anyone has moods, and, uh, but Lee's moods are, are very short, and he gets over them real fast. 
he's such a nice fellow, and he says he has to practice. Uh, do his friends impose upon him, or friends who really aren't friends, you know, being uh, as famous as he is? Not too much. Of course, you have it, you know, he always has some of it, but uh, he enjoys people in general, though, so he never has that much of a problem. What's been your most memorable moment with him in his golfing career? Mm, gosh, that's hard to say. Uh, I think winning the Open and the British Open and the Canadian in one year has got to be, you know, the greatest thing he's ever done.
there for a bird. That's a birdie. Does she like Dr. Pepper? <laughs> One more time. One more time. I Let's not look here. Somebody's looking the wrong way. Hey, come on. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Roberts, as we find churches and denominations struggling to be effective in today's world, what do you see happening here at the General Conference of the United Methodist Church? I came here with a real desire to see the United Methodist Church restructured in order that it may be most effective in this day. That's still my desire, still my dream, and I think the most important matter before us. We deal with social and political issues, but the important thing is preparing the church to deal on the local level with these issues. We'd like to wish Vern a happy honeymoon, and we're going to miss him throughout the rest of the tournament. Bye, Vern. Bye-bye.